Hi guys, it's Sean here from DigiDirect. Today we've got an exciting video for you. We're going to be taking an early hands-on look at the upcoming Panasonic GH5. Now, this is going to be Panasonic's new flagship Micro Four Thirds camera, replacing the GH4, obviously. It's a very video-centric camera, but it also does photos as well. We'll be looking a lot at video, although I'll touch on photos a little bit. There's a lot of features to go over here. Um, some of the headline ones that we'll, that we'll discuss will be 4K fo uh, video at 60 frames per second, internal 10-bit 422 recording, uh, the, the new auto uh, autofocus system on the camera, uh, in-body image stabilization, Panasonic's dual IS2 system on the camera, 6K photo, and much more. Now I am going to be showing you sample footage that I've shot with the GH5. Panasonic wanted me to add a caveat that this is a very early production unit. It's not even pre-production. They're considering it their pilot run. There's only five or six cameras in the world right now. Um, this one was actually serial number 001, which is pretty cool. But it, the image quality here is not necessarily representative of what the final production will be. So don't get too hung up on pixel peeping and so on in terms of image quality. Use it as a guide as to what you can shoot with it. But the, the final image quality may be a bit different from what we see here. But with all that being said, let's dive into it. We're gonna start by taking a look at the physical body. So the body does look similar to the GH4 and so on, but it's actually not exactly the same. It's about the same height and width, but it is noticeably a bit deeper. There's a bit more heft to it, it's a bit chunkier, a bit of a bigger grip and a, a kind of a cavity for your fingers on the edge of the grip there. Uh, it's a weather sealed camera just like the GH4, um, but now it's also freeze proof to up to negative 10 degrees Celsius, which the GH4 was not. They've added a joystick on the back. So now we can use this joystick to change our autofocus point or navigate menus, which I really, really like. I love using joysticks to just jump around menus really quickly. It's, I find it makes it, everything go a lot faster, which is great. Uh, it has 15 customizable function buttons across the body. Now that's including the joystick, which can be set as a customizable function button or rather a series of customizable function buttons as well. Speaking of menus, they have updated the menu system. They can, they've got uh, more menu options fit on the screen now. And they've, they've kind of categorized them. They have a sub-menu system now where things are categorized a little bit more logically. Uh, on previous menu systems, it was a little bit kind of all over the place. Now they've got sub-menus that make it a bit easier, especially with that joystick. I found myself jumping around menus really, really quickly. The camera now has a dual SD card slot. So it can take two SD cards. The GH4 can only do one. Both of these SD card slots are UHS-2 compatible. And you can adjust how, uh, how the, the media is addressed to the, to the cards. You can have it fill up one card and then the next. You can have it record to both at the same time. You can have one do stills, one be video, whatever. We've got a variety of ports on the side here, obviously a headphone jack and a mic port, but we do have a full-sized HDMI port, so not a mini or micro HDMI, a full-sized HDMI port on here. And one thing to note, when the camera is outputting HDMI to an external device, it can also at the same time record internally as well. So you can do both of those at the same time, which is cool. There's a new shutter, which is rated for 200,000 shots, and they have a new shutter mechanism, which is designed to reduce shutter shock. Now they had a mechanism like this on the G85, which is recent. This is actually a slightly different mechanism again on the GH5. We've got a nice large viewfinder here at the top. This is a very big viewfinder, very high resolution. It's 3.6 million dots. So very, very sharp, very high resolution. It looks really, really good when using it. The LCD screen has also been improved. It's brighter now and it's actually physically larger. It's 3.2 inches as opposed to three inches on the GH4. Uh, it's 1.6 million dots on that screen there. It does have the same battery as the GH4, which is nice because if you're upgrading, you can keep your batteries. Uh, I wasn't really able to put battery life through a huge test, but I shot with the GH5 for about half a day on a single battery and it was still plenty of charge left. So I'm optimistic that the battery life will be as good as it is on the GH4. Uh, in addition to Wi-Fi, the camera body also now has Bluetooth. So you can connect to your phone via Bluetooth. It's a bit easier and faster than using Wi-Fi. You don't have to set up your phone every time via Wi-Fi. It's just kind of always connected if you want to transfer photos and do remote operation of the camera from your phone. There's a new 20.3 megapixel sensor on the GH5. That's an increase from the 16 megapixel sensor on the GH4. Uh, the GH5 has no low-pass filter or anti-aliasing filter on it either. Um, now, it does also have a faster sensor readout than the GH4, about 1.66 times faster, so Panasonic told me. What this means is it will decrease the amount of rolling shutter. Now, there definitely is still rolling shutter. You can, you can see that in my test here, but it's actually quite good. Uh, they also have some built-in uh, rolling shutter reduction built into the camera as well. Pretty good for rolling shutter. It's not a global shutter, but not bad. And now 4K video now takes a full readout from the sensor, as opposed to on the GH4, which took a smaller sampling of the sensor, which meant you got a bit of a crop factor when you were recording in 4K versus 1080, for example. 
We don't have that now on the GH5. We don't have that crop factor because it's taking that full sensor readout. So that's gonna allow you to maximize the use of your wide angle lenses. You're not gonna have that additional crop factor, which is really nice. I think a lot of people are gonna be uh, into that. Panasonic also claims that this full sensor readout will improve low light performance. That wasn't something I was really able to test with my time with the camera. It was daytime stuff, but uh, that's what they've told me. Now we'll touch on video in just a minute here. I know everyone wants to hear about that, but first I'll just touch about the autofocus system briefly. It uses Panasonic's depth by defocus system, uh, but they've, they've made some improvements. It's faster algorithm, better system. They now have 225 autofocus areas. The GH4 had 49, so quite an, an increase in autofocus points. They've made it faster, especially they told me for tracking subjects. They have a lot of different settings that we can use to tweak the autofocus system. Uh, you know, based on the different type of movement, you might be shooting unpredictable movement versus predictable movement or static. You can go in and tweak all that if you like. Now the GH5 also has the, the 4K photo and post focus modes that previous Panasonic cameras have. Although now in the GH5, it's not 4K photo, it's 6K photo. And similarly, post focus is based on 6K photo. So these, you know, basically take a, a 6K video and you can pick out a frame from the resulting photo. What this means is since it's 6K, the photo now that you can pull from there is 18 megapixels rather than eight megapixels, which was from 4K photo. So a much higher resolution for these modes here. Uh, basically 18 megapixels now means it's almost as high resolution as if you just took a regular photo, not in one of these modes. It's obviously still JPEGs, not raw, but much higher resolution for these, these type of uh, photo modes. Now at the beginning there, I mentioned image stabilization. The GH5 has Panasonic's dual IS2 image stabilization system that we recently saw on the G85, for example. So this is a system that combines in-body image stabilization and image stabilization on the lens, uh, puts them together and gives you basically a better image stabilization system. Now, if you have a lens that doesn't have image stabilization, it'll still use the in-body system. It won't be quite as good as if you had both, but it's still better than none, which is what the GH4 has. So we've got some uh, image stabilization on the body here as well, which is really, really nice. This image stabilization is gonna be very useful for both photo and video. For photos, it lets you shoot at a lower shutter speed. You can see this shot here. I was shot at half a second. You can obviously the blur from the people moving, but the static parts in the background are nice and sharp. So very good for shooting low light conditions because you can use a lower shutter speed. Uh, and then for video, it's gonna remove a lot of that handheld shake. Look at here, I'm shooting at 140 millimeters here. So in full frame term, that's 280 millimeters. So quite a long focal length. There's obviously some movement here, but considering this is handheld and considering the focal length, that's pretty good. So this is gonna really help you uh, stabilize your handheld footage, not necessarily always at this focal length, but even if you're shooting wider, you can move around a lot more with the camera, which really adds to its flexibility. Considering the GH line of cameras is just really good for kind of being run and gun, considering they're quite small, yet they still shoot really good video. Um, this is just gonna add to that flexibility. If you can take it off the tripod more readily and shoot nice, stabilized, handheld footage, that's gonna really help with the, the quality and flexibility of your video shooting. So I'm really excited about that. I'm a big fan of in-body image stabilization for, for when shooting video. Uh, so I'm definitely excited about that and I was happy to see uh, how it was implemented. Okay, so let's start talking about what everybody's been waiting for, the video features. This is obviously a very video-centric camera. First off, let's talk about the record limit. There is none. So there's no 29 minute limit here. Uh, you can basically keep the camera and record. It'll keep going until the SD card fills up or the battery dies. We can now shoot 4K at up to 60 frames per second, which is uh, again, an improvement over the GH4 and over most cameras these days. Um, so that's nice if you don't want your, your slow-mo footage to have to be you know, a, a lower quality level, you can now shoot at 60 frames per second in 4K, which is really, really nice. Another big feature is the ability to internally record 10-bit 422 footage. Now this is something that people did a lot with the GH4 by using an external recorder, like an Atomos unit, for example, taking the output from the HDMI port of the GH4, uh, because the, the GH4 can only do 8-bit 420. Now, in the GH5, we don't need those recorder units, we can do 10-bit 422 internally. Now, it's a bit of a technical term, if you're not familiar with, with what that means, it's talking about its color resolution. So, uh, if you're doing anything that's gonna do, you know, a lot of heavy color grading, for example, or green screening, having that extra information is gonna definitely help you in the same way that shooting in 4K gives you more flexibility because you're capturing more data, you can do more with the footage than just shooting 1080. Even if you're eventually only delivering in 1080, shooting in 4K gives you that extra flexibility. Shooting in 10-bit 422 will give you the extra flexibility on the kind of the end, end of coloring and so on, even if you're only delivering in 8-bit. Um, if you're just using the, the camera casually for home videos and so on, don't worry too much about this, but if you're doing a lot of color grading and heavy post work, this is really, really good. Now one distinction I should make, that internal 10-bit 422 recording is only up to 4K 30 frames per second. It's not at 4K 60 frames per second. 
via the HDMI port, it can output 10-bit 42 at 4K 60 frames per second, just not internally. Now at 1080 and full HD, we can now shoot up to 180 frames per second uh, via their variable frame rate mode. So in the GH4, that was a max of 96 frames per second, so they've almost doubled it. Take a look at this shot here. This is, this is actually 150 frames per second. Super nice and slow, though. The reason it's 150, not 180, is because my SD card actually was not fast enough to shoot at 180. These are cards that I use on my GH4 all the time uh, in 4K, so you might have to look at some faster cards with this camera, uh, at least to access these features. But still, 150, very slow, very gorgeous shots. It's gonna be really interesting to see the kind of stuff you can shoot at 180 uh, frames per second here. And I'll just add, the thing that I really like about the variable frame rate mode in the, in the GH series is that it plays back to you already slowed down. You don't have to go into your editor to, to slow it down manually. This helps because it lets you vis visualize the shot a bit more because you can watch it back immediately in slow-mo and just save some time in your workflow as well. Obviously the camera has uh, focus peaking and zebra stripes like the GH4 did. Uh, but they've also added a couple new things now including a vector scope and a waveform monitor that you can pull up on screen while you're shooting. That's really, really interesting. So these are basically video scopes. If you, you know, if you do a lot of color grading, maybe in DaVinci Resolve or something similar, you'll be familiar with these kind of scopes. To be able to see them on screen while you're shooting, that's very unique. You don't see that in a lot of cameras, at least not in this kind of form factor and size and so on. So that's really cool. I was quite impressed with that. Also, when you're recording in V-Log, which is Panasonic's super flat picture profile, very low contrast, low saturation, uh, which is great for color grading because it gives you a lot of latitude, but it looks a little bit weird when you're recording. It just doesn't look very natural. Um, when you're recording in V-Log, you can display a LUT on the camera screen or in the viewfinder. So when you're looking at the footage, it looks a bit more normal, looks more closer to what it will look like after it's color graded, which will help with exposure and just help with getting the feel of the footage a bit better but it will record to the SD card in Vlog, which is very interesting. Now, Vlog is still a separate product. You have to buy it separately and, and put it on your camera. The, the unit here that I was playing with did not have Vlog on it, um, but uh, Panasonic has told me that people who pre-order the GH5 will get Vlog for free with the camera. The GH5 also has a Rec. 709-like picture profile. So Rec. 709 is a standard that a lot of broadcast type cameras commonly shoot in. Uh, this picture profile on the GH5 means it's going to be a bit easier to, you know, integrate footage from the GH5 with those types of cameras. The GH5 also has the ability to program automatic focus pulls. So you can go in and set up to three different focus points uh, and then set delay and, and timing and so on. And then when you start recording, it'll, it'll rack focus between those points based on the settings that you've set there. Now, this is you know, a little bit better than just doing touch focus, for example, because sometimes with touch focus, a camera can hunt for focus a little bit. Because you've pre-programmed these focus points, it's just gonna go directly between the different points without hunting at all. So it'll be nice, smooth, accurate focus transitions. This is gonna be useful if you're a one-man show or if you've got a really very specific focus point that pull that you've got to do, uh, that you, you know, have a very small margin of error. An interesting feature, certainly. Now, I'm just going to touch briefly on the firmware update schedule here. So at launch, Panasonic are going to announce a firmware release schedule. This is going to be free firmware. The reason why this is relevant is because at launch, the camera will be able to shoot 4K at up to 150 megabytes per second, which is all right. But after a free firmware update later in the year, that'll be increased to 400 megabytes per second or a max of 400 megabytes per second. The reason that Panasonic are doing it this way is because they say there currently aren't SD cards that are capable of recording that much data. There's a new SD card spec uh, due out later in the year. They're gonna time that release with when those SD cards come out so that people can actually shoot uh, and have the SD cards be capable of maintaining that kind of speed. Other things we'll see in firmware updates down the road is an anamorphic high-res video mode uh, and a profile that will be suited for uh, HDR 4K TV, so a higher dynamic range type uh, broadcast screen. Now, Panasonic is going to be releasing a new audio interface unit with the GH5 as well, similar to the YAGH interface unit that came out with the GH4. Now, that interface unit with the GH4 was a little clunky. It needed its own power. It was pretty big and bulky. They've tried to improve on that here. Uh, it's going to be called the XLR1. It's going to sit on top of the camera on the hot shoe mount. It will be powered by the camera, so it won't need an external power point. Uh, it doesn't have any cables because it's going to connect via the hot shoe point there. Uh, it's going to have two XLR jacks with independent levels, gain control, phantom power, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and it will record the audio to the SD card in the camera. It's also going to have a shoe mount on top, so you can still mount an external mic or a light or whatever you like on top of it. Now finally, the GH5 is going to be released in two different kits. The first one will be with a new 12-60mm to f2.8 to f4 
a Leica series lens, so one of their kind of premium build lenses, weather shield and so on. Um, it gives you a bit of extra range. That's a 12 to 60 millimeter on micro four thirds. It's a pretty long range, 24 to 120 millimeter equivalent on full frame um, at the expense of not being a constant aperture or it's gonna have a kit with the 12 to 35 2.8 lens. Now that's actually gonna be different than the existing 12 to 35 2.8. Um, I've been told that overall it would be similar. It's gonna have a cosmetic upgrade. The main difference between those two lenses, the, the older version and the newer version, is that the new one will be compatible with the dual IS2 system that's on the GH5. The current uh, 12 to 35 mil is only compatible with dual IS1 due to a hardware limitation. So you'll have better uh, image stabilization on the uh, GH5 with the newer lens. So that's been a lot of info and specs to throw at you. I hope you can wrap your head around all that. Uh, what is certainly clear though is that the GH5 is definitely gonna be uh, the most fully featured camera in terms of video functionality, at least in this, this kind of form factor and size and so on, uh, which is definitely something that I expected, but really the, the amount of video centric features they put in here is really impressive. Um, although it's not obviously all video, they've got you know improved autofocus, 6K photo modes and so on, but I think people right now are most interested in the video. It certainly impressed me. I would love to get a bit more hands-on time with it. I'm already a fan of the GH system. I shoot all these videos with it, my GH4. It's the camera, it's my main camera that I use for my personal projects and so on as well. So I really like the system. It looks like they've got some really good improvements. Hopefully I'll be able to bring you some more information in between now and April when the, the camera is actually out. So stay tuned for that. Uh, but in the meantime, you can order the GH5 on our website at www.digidirect.com.au. As I mentioned earlier, pre-orders of the GH5 will get Vlog for free. It's about a $99 product separately. Uh, you can also pre-order in one of our stores. We've got stores in the Sydney CBD, Bondi Junction, Miranda, Chatswood, the Melbourne and Brisbane CBDs, and a new one in Cannington, Western Australia, which is just outside of Perth. Thanks, guys. Take care.